Well, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a sweet celebration. Um, Thanksgiving's a day typically spent with friends and family giving thanks, being together, watching football and parades on TV, and sharing a meal. It's a relatively relaxed, fun holiday, apart from all the prepping, cooking, and cleaning that goes on, but that's for another day. Um, but that's not the feel for this holiday, the holy day that we're going to talk about today. The Day of Atonement was the most sacred day on the Israelite calendar. You can sort of feel that, even though some of the things we're reading about feel a little strange to us. As you read it slowly, you can feel the weight of this day. The word atonement is used by the Lord several times as he gives Moses the description of this holy day. It means at one mint. That is, to make what is separate and bring it back together. Because sin separates us from a holy God. God's holiness means he's utterly pure. Holiness and uncleanness are as incompatible as light and darkness. They literally cannot occupy the same space. The implication is that for anyone or anything to be fit for God's presence, it too must be holy. Likewise, as with physical impurity, moral uncleanness or impurity is contagious. Unclean things contaminate whatever they touch or come in contact with. That meant that the holiness of God's dwelling, the tabernacle, was constantly under threat of contamination from the sinful Israelites living around it. And we've said before, just as it gets hotter and more dangerous when you get closer to the sun, the tabernacle, as well as those who draw near to God's presence, must be holy or else there could be dire consequences. We've also said holiness and uncleanness can't come into contact with one another. The tabernacle reflects this principle through the materials and qualities of workmanship in each of its three sections, as well as in those who have access to it. The tabernacle and Levitical laws demonstrated to ancient Israel that the world of fallen mankind was full of death, disease, and sin. And so Israel was being taught to view the tabernacle, and indeed all of creation, um, as representing varying degrees of cleanness and uncleanness. Now, we've seen that the primary theme of Leviticus is God opening a way for humanity to dwell again in his divine presence. Atonement is also one of the major themes of this book. It's the way that makes life possible, that makes life possible with God, sorry, it makes life with God possible for his covenant people. And we've seen many, many times that sacrificial atonement accomplished both the ransom and purification God's justice demanded. As one commentator said, it's what allows God's presence to remain a burning, a burning bush, burning with fire, yet not consuming. God's gift to the Israelites was to accept sacrificial blood as the ransom payment in place of the sinner's blood, his very life, thereby delivering him from the Lord's justice and purifying him from sin's pollution. These sacrifices were designed with a threefold purpose. The first was to deter Israel from sin leading to repentance. The second was to provide symbolic payment for the debt of the wrongdoing, i.e. to pay the ransom. And third, to provide symbolic purification for the community from the contagious pollution and defilement caused by sin. And today we'll see God provided purification for the tabernacle as well. This allowed God to maintain his presence with his people without compromising his divine justice. And we pointed out that the Torah is a chiasm. Now, there should be a slide of this. So that's my uh, slide of the chiasm uh, uh, for the Torah. For the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I, th I think Michelle has talked at length about this, so I don't really want to go back into it. We've also said Leviticus is a chiasm. Today, we'll look at chapter 16, which details the rituals for the Day of Atonement an entire chapter dedicated to this one holy day. For our purposes, the Day of Atonement can be, can be compared to spring cleaning. 
After the long winter, some people turn their households upside down, tidying everything, washing windows, scrubbing floors, and thoroughly cleaning the house. Of course, they maintain, main, they maintain the home throughout the year, but spring cleaning is an annual time of concentrated and detailed washing and cleaning. Spring cleaning gives people the opportunity to take care of messes that accumulate over the year and are otherwise left unattended. In the days of the tabernacle and temple, Yom Kippur was sort of like spring cleaning. The idea is that over the course of a year, the tabernacle became more and more ritually unclean. As people trudged in and out, they carried with them ritual contamination, contamination sin, iniquity, and wickedness, leaving the residue of spirit, spiritual pollution in the holy place. To prevent the overaccumulation of spiritual pollution, God appointed the purification rituals of the Day of Atonement to cleanse his people. His priesthood and his sanctuary with the blood of the ram and the goat placed on the mercy seat in the most holy place. And let me just say, most holy place and holy of holies, I think I, inter I use them interchangeably through here. The most holy place means the holy of holies for those of you who have had different translations. Now, the Day of Atonement is one of the seven holy celebrations or festivals God gives his people in Leviticus, with the other six detailed in chapters 23 and 24. Yet here, God separated this holy day from all the others, giving it its own chapter. Because scholars believe chapter 16 isn't only the thematic center of the Torah, but the literary center as well. One reason for this idea is based on the overall structure of the book comprising 37 divine speeches. That is, where God speaks to either Moses or Aaron or both. And we'll see that there are 18 divine speeches spoken by God on either side of chapter 16. There are additional reasons for it being the thematic and literary center. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to read both Morales and Sklar's books for a more in-depth discussion than what I can do here. We've seen in the first 18 divine speeches in chapters 1 through 15, God is dealing with the Israelites approaching him through blood. And next semester, we'll see in the second half of Leviticus, chapters 17 through 27, it will deal with life in God's presence through increasing holiness with the overall goal being fellowship and union with God. Okay, so we have our slide of the Leviticus badges. We've seen that a lot. So these are the seven badges, and I want us to notice that we are smack in the middle of those seven badges, okay? We are badge number four. Chapter 16 is the section that's at the center of the center of the center of the Torah. Now I'm going to pull up another slide. That's it. Okay. Since the Day of Atonement is at the center of the center of the, of the center, it's something to really pay attention to as we're close to the heartbeat of the message of the Torah. So I think this is just a better illustration. At least for me, it was more visually um, adaptive for me. So we have the Day of Atonement. We're right here. Okay, this is the pinnacle. The tabernacle is sort of like this holy mountain that we're going on, okay, up to Christ or up to God. Um, because this chapter, Leviticus 16, isn't in the middle by chance. It points to the solution to a problem that we've encountered many, many times. How does sinful man dwell in the divine presence? And I hope you'll see the, this chapter as a vivid and public display of the purposes and meaning behind these sacrifices intended to reflect the love of God for his creation as he seeks to redeem and restore all of it. And so I first want to highlight the phrase mercy seat. It's used seven times in this chapter. Please note that God is the one who called it the mercy seat. It's not a man-made description. It's a God-given description. God could have called it the judgment seat or the wrath seat. But instead, he designated the most holy place within his sacred temple as a place of mercy Friends, please see God's heart for his children. He longs to bless his people and see them flourish. 
He is and has always been a God of mercy, of compassion and grace, slow to anger and abounding in love. Okay, so chapter 15 ended with these words from the Lord. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. Chapter 16 picks up, sorry, chapter 16, verse 1, picks up with God saying to Moses, after the death of the two sons of Aaron. It's important to note the narrative hasn't shifted time or place. Yes, the bodies have been removed, but here in chapter 16, God gives provision for the defilement and death which has been introduced into the very heart of the tent. Mercifully, God is going to deal with this problem because it's no longer just out there in the camp. There's now pollution and defilement happening right in God's dwelling. You no doubt notice that this chapter isn't arranged chronologically. It consists of four sections, beginning with an overview of Aaron's duties as high priest. It then details those rites he's to perform. It then tells of how the Israelites were to observe this day. And finally, it concludes by commanding future generations to celebrate the day annually, ensuring fellowship between the Lord and his people remained unbroken. In order to cleanse the entire sanctuary, Aaron had to enter the Holy of Holies, God's throne room. As one scholar said, the high priest's means of access proved his inadequacy for this role. Although he was designated for the ministry of entering the most holy place, he only entered once per year, and he did so with extreme caution and special preparation. It was both the most prestigious job in ancient Israel and the most dangerous. And we see this chapter begins with a stern reminder of the utmost caution needed. Because as we've said before, entering an earthly king's throne room required extreme care and respect. So then how much more so when approaching the heavenly king? And again, we see God's mercy as he details how to enter correctly so Aaron doesn't face the same fate as his sons. Verses 3 through 5 identify the conditions Aaron must fulfill in order to enter the Holy of Holies. First, he must have the necessary animals, which is one bull, two goats, and two rams. And then he needs the proper clothing. He was to put on simple clothing. Scholars call these garments of humility. He wasn't to wear his normal priestly garments those described in Exodus 28 as for glory and for beauty, as they had kingly overtones. There's no reason given for the clothing clothing choice, but scholars believe it may have been because it was inappropriate to wear king-like garments when approaching the heavenly king's presence. The text states that Aaron and all future high priests were to wear a holy linen coat or tunic, linen undergarments, a linen sash, and a linen turban. These were simple white garments and represented a humble state or attitude, symbolizing the need for forgiveness and contrition. Now, before putting on these clothes, Aaron was to ritually cleanse. And this was more than just washing his hands and feet, but rather was full immersion, underscoring the need for complete purity in approaching a holy God. Okay. So now with the animals identified, verses 6 through 10 give an overview of what Aaron was to do with the purification offerings, the bull and the goats. Aaron was to offer a bull as a purification offering for himself and his family, which necessarily included the priests. As we saw during the ordination ceremony, this indicates all priests need atonement. Aaron was then to cast lots for the two goats, perhaps using the Urim and the Thummim. The lots indicate one goat was for the Lord and was to be sacrificed as a purification offering. The other goat was for Azazel, and it was to be sent into the wilderness. Now, scholars are unsure of the exact meaning of the word Azazel, but offer three main ways of interpretation. The first is that Azazel is a name as it starts with a capital A, as though paralleling the Lord's personal name, Yahweh, also with a capital Y. 
There is evidence that the earliest interpreters of Leviticus understood this as the name of a spiritual being, a demon who resides in the wilderness named Azazel. But note, this goat wasn't sacrificed to this being, but rather was used as a sign of utmost content, sending back to the demon a load of sin and defilement. But scholars note there's difficulty with this explanation as the Lord had clearly told the Israelites to have nothing to do with false gods. And so involving a demon in this rite might risk their turning, in, turning this into some form of appeasement to this demon. The second explanation for Azazel is that it meant rough or rocky place. Sklar notes that support for this approach is found in the Arab, Arabic word azazu, which means rough ground, and would be another way of referring to the land as cut off, or as the NIV translates it, a remote place. Third, Azazel could be a compound term consisting of the noun ez, meaning goat, and the verb azel, which means to go away or disappear. That is, a goat that departs, it goes away. And it's this approach that leads to the traditional understanding scapegoat, since the goat departs, bearing all of Israel's sins. Although scholars remain divided on these interpretations, the overall function of the goat remains clear, to make atonement on the Israelites' behalf, bearing their sins away. Okay, now to the detailed instructions for the ceremony, which are found in verses 11 through 19. The ceremony consisted of three main rites interwoven as one, an entrance rite of the high priest into the Holy of Holies, a cleansing rite of the entire tabernacle, tabernacle, um, and third, an elimination rite of the people's sins into the wilderness. Now, in the ancient Near East, performing a ceremony three times was a way of underscoring, underscoring the atonement accomplished on this day was full. It was complete. So the purification offerings which atoned for Israel by cleansing their impurities and sins from the sanctuaries. It should be noted that their initial rites focused on cleansing the Holy of Holies, the very heart of the tabernacle, and worked worked its way outwards to the holy place and to the burnt offerings. And I'm going to have a slide of the tabernacle here. Okay. So this is how it was on the ground. And I think it's important that we note that I have these um, directional notifications here. We have north, south, west, and east. Um, So it's a very rude drawing, obviously. Um, But you get get the idea. Okay, so keep that in mind. We may want to just keep that slide up. Okay, thanks. Aaron began by making atonement to purify the holy of holies of his and the priest's sins and impurities in three stages. He first offered the bull to make atonement for himself and his family. The blood would be collected in a vessel. He also then would take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense that's beaten small inside the veil, so in there, um, to conceal the atonement cover that's over the testimony. So we're there at the farthest point west, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, inside the Ark of the Covenant were the two stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. So that's where he's gone in. He's gone in from the east, and he's gone as far west as he can go in the tabernacle. Scholars believe the incense, incense cloud protected Aaron from death, either by shielding him from exposure to the Lord's glory or by serving as a type of atonement gesture as he approached the Lord's throne. Aaron then retrieved the bull's blood, which he sprinkled on the atonement cover, as well as sprinkling the blood before it seven times. This captures the thought behind the Hebrew word for atonement, kippur, which means to cover. Sin was not removed, but covered over by sacrificial blood. Why was atonement made here on the Ark of the Covenant? Sklar says it's because the priest's sins were rebellions against the Lord's kingly rule and their impurities were incompatible with this kingly rule. These sins are believed to have defiled the very object, 
the very object that represented that rule, namely, where the Lord sat enthroned as king. Aaron then repeated this procedure with the blood of the goat as a purification offering on behalf of the nation. Like the blood of the bull, the goat's blood purified the holy of holies, so he would have taken the blood from the east and taken it all the way into the west, to the far west there, into the holy of holies. Like the blood of the bull, the goat's blood purified the holy of holies from the sins and impurities belonging to the nation of Israel. And in sprinkling it with blood to the ancient Israelites, it depicted that the entire holy of holies was cleansed. It was purified. It was again consecrated, meaning it was in the state of ritual holiness once again. And note that the impurities spoken here include uncleanness or unintentional sins, such as eating sacrificial meat while unknowingly being ritually unclean. And this would include both intentional and unintentional sins. Now, we know intentional sins pollute and leads to punishment and even death. But unintentional sins also endanger the sinner. For example, in Leviticus 4, we read that an unintentional sin by the high priest results in the people suffering until it's been properly addressed, but can be atoned for by sacrificial blood. Again, unintentional defiling of holy things was considered a sin and had to be addressed. As had been said, but I think needs to be repeated here, sin endangers and it pollutes. The Israelites on the Day of Atonement in chapter 16, verse 30, are described as being cleansed from their sin. Because sin also was seen as that which defiled. Hence the sanctuary, God's dwelling, was defiled because of its proximity and use by sinners, whether intentional or unintentional. In Sklar's words, sin was viewed as that which defiled the sanctuary in particular almost as though it were an impure dust that settled on the tent of meeting and its contents. And that to me was just really helpful for me to see that rule and to see that atonement purifies and ransoms. In addition to covering unintentional sins, it also included sins against the Lord for which sacrificial atonement wasn't generally an option, namely sins of, rebel of rebellion. Pesa is the word for that in Hebrew. It means rebelling against a superior and or referring to the high-handed, full-scale rebellion against a king. As scholars note, verse 16 encouraged the Israelites that if one of their members had committed such a sin, the Lord wouldn't hold it against the entire community, even if that person remained defiant. The sinner alone would suffer for his sin, but not the nation. Even more, verse, six, verse 16 also encouraged the repentant sinner that the intentional sin by the rebellious sinner had been atoned for. Now, naturally, any relevant civil penalties would still apply, and the Lord might still discipline, but the sin itself no longer held, um, hung over the sinner's head. So while individuals couldn't bring a sacrifice for rebellious sins to make atonement, God, in his mercy, beautifully, generously on this day, allowed those who committed rebellious sins to look again to the Lord with repentant hearts and be assured their sins were atoned for. And please note that these rites were powerless unless accompanied by faith. Verses 16 to 17. Just as he had cleansed the Holy of Holy, Aaron then cleansed the tent of meeting, placing blood on the incense altar and sprinkling it seven times before it. Since only priests were in inside the tabernacle, verse 17 is a warning to them in particular. Aaron was to go into the tabernacle alone as the representative of the entire nation to make atonement for himself and all Israel. He then came out to the burnt offering altar and performed similar rites to cleanse and consecrate it. Okay, do we see the burnt off, um, altar out there on the far side on the east? Scholars note that the word cleanse here is indicative of moving into a state of ritual purity and the word consecrate into a state of ritual holiness. This made the altar fit for use so that the Israelites could confidently draw near to the Lord with their sacrifices throughout the year. 
Do you see the picture being painted here? The pollution of sin and impurity had been washed. It's been swept from the deepest, most holy room of the tabernacle outwards. The Day of Atonement reverses the steady movement of uncleanness towards the tabernacle throughout the year. Because on this day, all the pollution of Israel has been swept. It's been taken out, and now it waits to be carried away entirely. And it started at the western part of the tabernacle, at the Ark of the Covenant, where God dwelled, and it moved eastward. You may remember that in the Bible, moving westward is symbolic of a return to the garden and the presence of God, while heading east often relates to exile or moving away from God. Friends, do not miss this imagery. God is giving them a vivid picture. of removing their sins from inside the tabernacle, the courtyard, and far away from the camp to darkness and death. Okay, verses 20 through 22. Once Aaron has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. Scholars note that this rite with the scapegoat addressed sins as a lethal substance or biohazard that had to be removed from the camp. And so Aaron began by confessing all the Israelite sins and placing them on the goat. This is in keeping with a biblical principle that confession is the necessary first step when seeking atonement. Psalm 32, 5 says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Okay, so then the goat then bore on itself all their sins to a land cut off, a land that's remote. This removed the lethal substance of sin from the camp very publicly. Unlike the other rite Aaron performed in the Holy of Holies where he was entirely alone, this rite was done publicly in the sight of the entire camp who could watch the goat, laden with their sin, and disappear into the wilderness never to return. And the goat bore not only their sins but also the penalty their sins deserved. As we've seen before in purification offerings, when Aaron lay his hands on the head of the goat, he was symbolically transferring his and the nation's guilt to the animal, implying the goat was now responsible for them. This would show Israel's desire to repent of sin and obey God. Additionally, the goat was to bear all their iniquities on itself. This phrase, to bear iniquity, is used elsewhere to refer to bearing sin and its penalty. Crucially, it demonstrated the transference of all the sins and impurity of Israel onto the goat, which was then led into the wilderness by an Israelite selected for the job. That goat would never return, and thus Israel's sin would never return either. And finally, the goat was sent to a remote land. The word remote is built on a root word used to describe people being removed from worship at the temple cut off from life or, for the, or from the Lord himself. One scholar stated that the Bible's use of the, world wilder, of the word wilderness here is analogous to that of the waters of chaos, a place of non-creation, so that in removing sin from Israel, the Azazel goat removed chaos from creation. As both goats begin to gather at the doorway to the tent of meeting, their movements are tracked along an east-west alignment. The goats are one symbol, sorry, the goats as one symbol stand for the sake of Israel. The sacrificed goat conveying Israel favorably into the Holy of Holies vicariously that led the led away goat conveying Israel's sins away from the place of God. As the psalmist says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has removed our transgressions from us. 
How merciful is the God of Israel, who wanted them to know their sins were gone, at least until next year. We use scapegoat today to refer to unjustly attributing blame to someone who isn't responsible. In the Bible, it's a matter of grace, not injustice. God graciously provided a way to entirely remove his people's sins from them so that they would be clean. And we'll talk about this more in just a few more moments. And similar to the two birds of Leviticus 14 used to purify one with a skin disease, restoring him to community and fellowship, scholars note that the text portrays these two goats as a set. The high priest takes them both from the congregation of Israel presents them both together before God at the door of the tent of meaning, and then casts lots for them both. Moreover, verse 5 refers to both goats together as a single purification offering. As the scholar Morales says, the expulsion rite isn't an offering in the technical sense. Nevertheless, in removing sin, the scapegoat function fits the precise significance of purification, or hatat in Hebrew, and combined with the blood manipulation of the sacrificed goat, completes the picture of atonement. Additionally, there's historical precedent precedent for understanding these goats to be identical in appearance and chosen because of their likeness. Purification from sin's pollution and removal of sin's guilt. And scholars note that the use of these three terms to remove their transgressions, their sins, their uncleanness. And this section gives extreme emphasis to the idea of Israel's sinfulness and depravity, including all offenses that remain secret or were never confessed, like sexual misbehavior, theft, and idolatry. They note that first term transgression may be the most important as it's the most grievous word for sin in the Old Testament. It refers to sin in its grossest manifestation, indicating a breach of relationship between two parties. As one commentator said, this was atonement for the greatest depths of sin. Again, beautifully, mercifully, God is making abundantly clear to his people that for those who are truly repentant, all of it was removed. Okay, now we're going to go to the burnt offering. Verses 23 through 29. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he first, when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. According to Sklar, in order to perform the special purification rites, Aaron had entered a higher spirit ritual state by taking off his regular clothes, washing his body and putting on linen garments. Now he is to ready himself to offer the burnt offerings by reversing his actions by returning to his regular ritual state. We see he took off the linen clothes, leaving them in the holy place. He bathed, and he put on the high priestly garments. Verse 24b says, He then offered burnt offerings to make atonement for himself and for the people. This included one ram as a burnt offering for himself and one ram for the people. Scholars believe these burnt offerings underscore the atonement that had already taken place and perhaps also express worship and thanksgiving for the Lord's provision of such atonement. Verse 25, Aaron then burned the purification offering fat on the burnt offering altar. As seen in other purification offerings, the fat was given to the Lord. Verse 26, the man who released the scapegoat was able to bathe before, um, sorry, was also to bathe before he could re-enter the camp, thereby purifying himself of any defilement contracted by handling the sin-laden goat. Verse 27, and the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall be carried outside the camp. So the purification offering skin, flesh, and dung were burned at a place outside the camp, and this too followed the pattern of other purification offerings. The belief for this is that when it came to sacrifice made for their own sin and impurity, neither priests nor people could profit by eating from its meat. Verse 28 says that the one who burned 
Thieves was then to wash his clothes and bathe before returning to camp, implying he had contracted ritual impurity by this event, underscoring again the need for purity within the camp. Verse 29 through 31, it gives the details on how to observe this day, saying, And it shall be a statute to you forever, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. Is it? it is a statute forever. Verse 29 gives the Israelites three different instructions. First, they must observe this day perpetually, a statute forever, in the seventh month on the tenth day. This would make it on the Hebrew calendar roughly September or October around the harvest. Second, they were to afflict or humble themselves. This refers to fasting and other possible forms of self-denial, including ointments. Scholars believe such self-denial often accompanied repentance as an outward sign of a humble and repentant heart. Again, without faith, these rites would have mattered little. The Israelites were to acknowledge and turn from their sins. Third, in this passage, it was to be a Sabbath of solemn rest, where no work was to be done, underscoring the day's holiness, allowing a focused time of prayer and petition to the Lord. Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32, says the Day of Atonement was a Sabbath day celebration, which meant the Israelites were to refrain from all work. Anyone who didn't observe the Sabbath was to be cut off from his people, which is a euphemism meaning to be put to death. Again, the language here is different from the other feast. If you decide not to participate in this most solemn Sabbath feast, there was punishment. Moreover, this was a day when the people were to afflict yourselves, which according to scholars included fasting. This then would be the only religious holy day which was characterized by mourning, fasting, and repentance. Three times in chapter 23, where it addresses the Day of Atonement, it speaks about denying yourself on this day. It was a day for devoting yourself or oneself entirely to the seriousness of this event. I hope as you read this chapter, you felt the weight of it for the ancient Israelites. These instructions were given both to the, I'm sorry, verse 29c. These instructions were given both to the native and the stranger who sojourns among them. Now, the natives were Israelites who were full citizens with land rights once in the, prom in the promised land. And the stranger were non-Israelites who would reside in the promised land but didn't own the land since all of it belonged to Israel. But enjoyed, but these people, the um, sojourners, enjoyed most of the same rights, protections, and responsibilities under the law as full citizens. Additionally, scholars note the chiastic structure of verses 29 through 31. Verse 31 repeating the instructions of verse 29, but just in reverse order. At the chiasm's heart is verse 30, reiterating that this day's purpose was to make atonement for the Israelites and so purify and cleanse them from all their sins. As Michelle discussed last time, we see purification language over and over again in relation, to, in relation to sin because sin often leaves the sinner feeling dirty. Significantly, verse 30 makes unequivocally clear that purification had been achieved. The Israelites were pure before the Lord and could rest assured that their covenant relationship with him would continue. Verse 32 through 34 says, And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. Since this was to be a statute forever, future high priests were to perform these atoning rites annually. 
This stresses the centrality of making atonement by mentioning it five times in these three verses. Clearly, atonement was necessary in order for an impure and sinful people to continue in relationship with a pure and holy God. Okay. So to the ancient Israelites, the Day of Atonement would have been received and experienced as an expression of God's love. God wanted to leave them with no doubt. They were forgiven, they were renewed, and provided with a clean slate for another year. It painted a beautiful picture of confident forgiveness of sins, as well as symbolic purification of the tabernacle and the community. However, it was limited in application and had to be repeated annually. We know there was a deficiency, not in the ritual, but in the humans surrounding the tabernacle. It was their sin that kept defiling both themselves and God's dwelling year after year. As Hebrew 10, 3 through 4 says, but in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. What was needed was something that would purify not only the tabernacle, but the corrupt and selfish human heart. Beautifully, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement points to Jesus. We see in this holy day the Old Testament and the New Testament working together. They're pointing us to Jesus and his redemptive work for our lives. Here we see a preview of the perfect work of atonement to be made by God's Son. And we should see that the redemption of our sins through Jesus wasn't God's plan B. Though the ancient Israelites couldn't have known fully, the Day of Atonement proclaimed the gospel hope every year. Jesus is the reality to which all these sacrificial symbols and rituals were pointing to all along. As Hebrews 10.1 says, For the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, not the true form of these realities. The law could never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. Because in Jesus, the threefold purpose of the Day of Atonement sacrifices are met. He is our ransom, our purification, and our repentance allowing believers to draw near God's life-sustaining, life-giving presence. First, he's our ransom. Jesus offered his life and his death as a substitute on behalf of others. He became what we are, destined for death as a result of our collective and individual evil. Mark 10, 45 says, The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And 1 Peter 18 through 19 says, You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without a blemish or spot. Second, Jesus is our purification. Titus 2, 14 says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his own. And Hebrews 10 says, And by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So then how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And finally, Jesus is our repentance. His sacrificing himself was an act of love aimed at changing people's hearts. Remember the two goats offered up for the people? The scapegoat would symbolically be sent outside the camp in order to remove Israel's sins. The goal was to look at this expression of God's mercy and allow this divine love to permeate and motivate a whole new way of life. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because you have been set free, free from the law of sin and death. Friends, the commands no longer have any power to condemn us. 
we have been freed from their demands by the life and work of Jesus. Additionally, the high priest in Leviticus 16 is a preview, a picture of the great work of Jesus, the Messiah. He was humble, spotless, and alone. Each of these aspects was perfectly fulfilled by Jesus in accomplishing the ultimate work of atonement. On the day of atonement, the high priest was humble, clothed only in linen garments. He was spotless, cleansed by immersion. He was all alone. Over 20 times we're told that Aaron as the high priest was to do the work required alone. Yet there is an important point of contrast. Aaron and every high priest descended from him was a sinner and must make atonement for his own sin, own sin first. Whereas Hebrews 7 says, he has no need, we're talking about Jesus, like those high priests to offer, other, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Friends, I hope such hope, I find such hope in knowing that Jesus is atoned for every sin I've ever committed and every sin I will ever commit. That phrase, once for all, is so beautiful and so powerful. Yes, the day of atonement is about sin and the bloody sacrifices required to atone for it, but even more, the day of atonement is about grace. It's about God's grace in our lives. Because maybe as you read the description of the Day of Atonement and of Christ's sacrifice, your heart defaulted not to worship and gratitude, but to guilt and fear. Maybe instead of feeling grateful that Jesus carries it, you feel burdened by the weight of your shame. And for those of us who are wired that way, we don't need reminders of our sin as we think about our failures 24-7. Let me just read the description of the Day of Atonement found in Leviticus 23, 28. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. The ancient Israelites were to lay aside their work and rest on that day. Both the giving of the offering and the commitment to stop working were meant to be physical expressions of the Israelites' heart toward God. God didn't need their gifts, and he didn't need their rest. He was asking them to take steps of humility as an outward expression of their grief over their sin and their trust in his protection and provision. When we struggle to accept God's gift of grace, it might appear that we're being humble. But in reality, failure to accept that Jesus has fully atoned for your sins is a sneaky form of pride. When we fail to accept that God's grace is enough to cover our sins, to transform us into, our, into his image, we're living in pride because the focus is really on us. Please don't miss that Jesus is the one who did the work required for us to be at one with God. We're free to face we're free to rest in God's elaborate grace because of Jesus. Okay, now let me briefly mention other comparisons between the Day of Atonement and Jesus. Jesus took our sins upon himself and carried them outside the camp of Jerusalem to the cross like a despised and unclean scapegoat. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. At the cross, Jesus was treated as though unclean, like the carcass of a sin offering disposed after the Day of Atonement ceremony. Hebrews 13, 12 says, So Jesus offers, also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Unlike the Old Testament priest, who, after having presented the completed sacrifice of himself and the nation, Jesus had no need to flee God's presence. Instead, he confidently sat down in heaven and rules all of creation. 
Hebrews 10, 11 says, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Because of Jesus, Christians now have confidence to enter the most holy place by his blood. And Hebrews 10, 19 says, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, believers are made holy. The most common designation for believers in the New Testament is saints or holy people. That means that we now belong inside the most holy, inaccessible place, the most holy place of the tabernacle. The proof of this is that God's Holy Spirit now lives inside believers. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, excuse me, of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, of it to the praise of his glory. As such, we are now being made into his likeness, becoming the kind of humans God made us to be, a kingdom of priests and a blessing to the nations. The New Testament idea of atonement is that our sin is not merely covered, but removed, taken away, so there's no longer any barrier between God and man. The ultimate hope of the Bible is that God's presence will one day extend through all creation. One day, sin and impurity will have nowhere to flee, and all of creation will be full of God's presence. In Revelation 21, the Apostle John writes, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Sorry, I'm lost. The Day of Atonement anticipated that time. God had planned since Adam and Eve's fall that he would do what they could not do. He would demonstrate his great love for his people by sending his son to demonstrate to the world how to live. The meaning of Jesus' death offers a new perspective on God's love for us because in Jesus we see the heart of God revealed that he would rather die than to live without us. Friends, we have been wholly loved, completely forgiven, counted righteous, and freed from the law's ability to condemn us. We have been braced by the God who really knows us. He knows who we, not, who know, he knows who we are. He knows our struggles. He knows the ways we have stepped on others and have fought for ascendancy. And yet, he says, we are completely his. As the Holy Spirit infuses us with his glorious good news, we'll find within ourselves a desire to love, to forgive, to believe the best about others. We'll find that the love that has been poured into our heart by the Spirit pushes us out towards the unlovely, to the needy, the lost, fulfilling Jesus' command to lay down our lives in love. Perfect love has been given to us. Therefore, let us seek to love the way our Father has loved us. Let me pray. Dear Father, thank you for offering up your sinless Son. Thank you that uh, Jesus set aside his heavenly glory and came to earth as a man to live as a perfect life so that you could willingly give that perfect life as a ransom for many to pay the price for all the sin of the world. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.